This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Casper, a better mattress for a better night's sleep. To find out more, try one for 100 days and get a $50 discount, visit casper.com slash macvoices. And by iChart Magazine, putting Apple and tech news in focus. Subscribe in iTunes or find out more at iChartMag.com. Welcome back to Mac Voices or Mac Notables on Mac Voices or a combination of both. I'm not quite sure which, because this time we're talking to Mr. Jason Snell. Jason, it's great to have you back. Hi, Chuck. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's always always a pleasure. This time, though, we're not going to do the Mac Notables format. We're going to talk about a book that you've authored and a Take Control book to boot. So I'm really confused on just how this is going to work. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I, I was in the clutches of Adam and Tanya Angst, who said, hey, Jason, might have some time, which I basically, I think I didn't, but uh, well, let's have him write a book. And I haven't written a book, a computer book in a long, 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 long time. Um, so I thought it would be a good experience to uh, give it a try. And the uh, uh, photos for Mac was but a rumor. Uh, you know, they, they had announced that it would exist and that was all we knew. Um, and so I signed up for it. And then the moment they dropped that first beta, I started working on uh, getting to know it. This is this is going to be a really interesting interview because this is – well, first of all, the, the book is Photos, a Take Control Crash Course, which, of mm -hmm. course, focuses on the Photos app for the Macintosh. So in, in the first place, this is your first book in a long, long time. In the second place, I haven't even opened the Photos app yet, so I'm, I'm coming at it as a total novice. Well, that's um, good. And then there's the new Crash Course format that Take Control is using for some of their books. And I'll be anxious to see just how you felt about using that format for this. But but let's just take it from the top. Jason, what do you think of photos? I like it. I have to say, I, I have had to spend a lot of time with it, and I like it. It is much better than iPhoto. It's missing some features, but it is generally better than iPhoto. Um, the iCloud photo library stuff, when it works, is kind of amazing. The pricing isn't my favorite, but um, basically I have 52,000 photos that I have access to from all of my devices now, which means if there's an obscure photo from you know 15 years ago that I want to call up on my iPhone, I can do it. Uh, there are some issues with that that they need to work out. I think I think parts of Apple weren't aware of what would happen when the photo library thought that it had 50 some thousand odd photos in it and things act weird and slow down and are not are not always ideal but um those are those are quirks that need to get worked out but the the fundamental thing of having access to those photos everywhere and i think most excitedly on a mac with an ssd being able to have access to your whole photo library even though it won't fit on your drive is really great uh, my wife and i both have uh, computers with SSDs and not spinning disks. And we have a big server with a uh, spinning disk. And with iCloud Photo Library and Photos for Mac, we can um, we can have a really nice interface into something that shows us all our photos without them all actually being resident on our hard drives. And that is a good thing. So, you know, I, I think, but even without iCloud Photo Library, this is basically a new version of, of iPhoto. And it works uh, I think generally pretty well as a replacement for iPhoto. Apple sort of sold it as a replacement for Aperture, and it's not that. It's got some features that Aperture had, but it really is, you know, it, it really is like iPhoto. In the old days, they would have called this iPhoto 10 with an X, but uh, they seem to have stopped doing that now, and it's just photos for Mac. Okay, you, you intrigued me right up front because you said you're not happy with the pricing of this. I thought the yeah. pricing was free. <laughs> no, it's the iCloud iCloud Photo Library. Um, oh, oh, that part okay. is um, not as cheap as most of Apple's cloud storage competitors, including you know Amazon's got a Prime members get unlimited photos, and you know, and then there's a, a really cheap price for people who aren't Prime members. Um, Dropbox, obviously, you get a terabyte when you buy when you buy uh, Dropbox these days. Um, Apple's Apple's rates are a lot higher than most of their competition. Now the argument is, yeah, but you get the app for free, and you get the integration with the operating system for free, and th then what you pay for is storage. That's all true. I, I just I, I think it's too much. I think that compared to their competition, 
Um, you know, if you're, if you're going to tell somebody, it's great that you can have all your photos accessible, but you're going to, you have so many photos that you're going to have to pay $20 a month, $20 a month just to sync your photos. It's probably too much. So, um, I, I hope that Apple will adjust its, uh, its rates. Cause I do fear that, that, um, you know, the alternative is that people will just say, forget it. I'm just going to use, uh, some other s- service, which won't be as good, but it'll be a lot cheaper. And then I think that degrades the the whole uh, iOS experience when people are getting iCloud alerts and you're out of space and all of that. I think it's just kind of a bad experience and and it seems unnecessary for Apple to be charging what they're charging for a product like that. Okay, I want to ask a question and then I'll ask another question. But the basis for the first question is, are you you really a photo guy? I mean, do you take the time to tag and label your photos and do all that or do you just kind of throw them in? I used to be... um, I used to be more of a, a photo organizer than I am. I mean, and the answer is I had, you know, I had a kid and, and I took a lot of photos and then I had a second kid and I had no time to do any more tagging of photos. Um, but, you know, with the face detection stuff and uh, geotagging and just the time, you can do a lot of uh, smart grouping of photos. And that's actually one of the things that most impressed me about photos for Mac is the search is really good. Like if you want to look at your photos from Hawaii, you just type Hawaii and all your photos from Hawaii show up. If you, it, it's very easy. I'm not sure if you can do a smart search or you, or you need to, to do a, uh, a smart album, but if you want all the photos of a, f- a couple of people as, and this was there in, in iPhoto as well, you can use the face detection stuff, say, show me pictures of these two people together. And it just does it. So you don't have to ca- do manual categorization. Like, like you used to, you can, um, there is still a full kind of keywording system inside of photos like there was in iPhoto. But um, I, I feel like a lot of the technology advancements have made it less necessary to do that. Okay, I asked that question because, and, and I'm sure I'm going to get hate mail for this. Is, but, but is it, and I know this is one of the selling points, but is it really necessary or that beneficial to have 52,000 photos at your command all the time, everywhere? Well, do I need, if I need, you know, when I'm out and about, do I need all 52,000 photos in my library? Maybe not, although I've already had it happen where I'm like, oh yeah, I have that photo somewhere and I've been able to search for it and find it. I do think though, if you're visiting family and you've got an iPad and you want to show something that's in a, that's in your library, yeah, having that available is, is really good and not having to remember to sync it before you, before you leave, I think is really good. I do admit that it's, more important that all the photos you take with your phone sync back to the library. And, that, you know, as somebody, again, with multiple Macs, um, I like the idea that my Mac doesn't have to have all of these photos on it and that they, they live in the cloud. I do think that there's probably some granularity that Apple could provide that they don't at this point, which would be, you know, only sync certain albums or something like that with the, uh, with the phone. But the reality is they're not on the phone. There's a little thumbnail on the phone. And then if you tap on it, it loads it. So I think the, the bigger challenge is more about navigation, being able to find your way around in those 50,000 photos than it is their presence. Cause they're kind of not present other than a really low resolution thumbnail. They, they don't exist on your, on your phone until you tap and then it loads the full resolution file in the background. Okay. I, I just, you know, I'm just just curious because I'm not that much of a photos guy, even though I have a large photo library because of family photos and all that. Well, I like imagine if I'm visiting my mom and we we're talking about the family reunion we went to in Pennsylvania a couple of years back. I, I can actually search for Pennsylvania on my iPad and and call up those photos and say, oh, you know, here are those photos we were talking about and see them in full resolution. That is kind of great. You may you may not need it all the time but it is kind of great that it's that it's there and you have access to it everywhere and if you're somebody like like my mom who doesn't have a laptop anymore she just has an ipad and an iphone you know that that could be her library that she could have all her photos that she takes and they just kind of accumulate to her library and they're they're in the cloud and they're on her devices and that's kind of great too so it's not for everybody and and you know people can the the nice thing about photos for Mac is it, I think some people have made it out to be this Trojan horse uh, and inside it is iCloud photo library and a monthly bill. And that's not true. You don't have to turn on iCloud photo library and it works fine. It works just fine. It doesn't require it in any, uh, in any way. Oh, somehow we got really 
right out of the gate on this one, but I'll, I'll follow up with one more thing because everything you're saying there is predicated on tagging or grouping or having processed the photos, even if it's through f the photos built in algorithms. Uh, how, how, how good are those algorithms at this point? Are they better than they were in iPhoto or about the same? It's about the same. I mean, it, it, it's automatically grouping based on times, the times that you took the pictures. And it's pretty good at removing the duplicates if you try to import things it's already seen. It says, oh, I already have those. I don't need to, I don't need to import those. Um, but it is, you know, it's a progression from iPhoto. I, I, I am unclear on whether they uh, used elements of iPhoto or whether they rewrote it, but, but kept a lot of the features of iPhoto. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's nothing groundbreaking compared to the last version of, of iPhoto in that respect. It's still just kind of trying to be smart about the metadata in your photos and organizing them appropriately because the philosophy's definitely shifted away from managing all your stuff yourself and letting the computer be smart about organizing things for you based on data because most people don't have the time or inclination to organize them uh, manually. Okay, so now let's pull back just for a second and, and kind of start over. This is a brand new app, and yep. you are an author that hasn't written in a long, long time, and you've got a brand new format to 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 write write this book in. How did you how did you approach it uh, so that it really is a crash course as opposed to a thorough examination of all of the features of the software? Honestly, um, well, I would argue it is a thorough examination in a way. It's funny. Um, the the uh, the format is not that different from magazine format. In fact, the way it was pitched to me by Tanya Angst was it's like a series of magazine articles. And that's that's kind of accurate. The the idea is you pick the things that you think people are going to care about and you and then you um, distill down the most important things. And what I'd say about the format, because it's a 60 page book, is it is. It is a distillation. It's dense with information. It's not hard to read at all, but it's dense with information. And the idea there is you think about writing a book or reading a book and you think of something like, oh, you know, paragraph after paragraph and occasionally there's a screenshot that, you know, you refer to and say, look at that screenshot. And the Take Control uh, Crash Course series is not like that. There's a column down the left side with text and a column down the right side with images and sidebars. And, um, you know, if you reference the, you know, an image on a page, the image is right next to it, which means that putting it together, I wrote it in, uh, we, um, they use nicest writer to, to build this thing, uh, in layout view. And, uh, you know, it was, took me back to my college newspaper days of working in PageMaker. It was that it very much, if I had tried to write this in a text editor or a word processor, it would have been a huge waste of time because really what you're doing is boiling things down into this space, tying it closely with the pictures and the sidebars. They're all, um, you know, you're really building this thing page by page rather than writing a whole bunch of words and letting somebody flow it into a template later. Um, and I, I think that's why it works as a, as a, as a dense, clear, um, boiled down kind of thing. What I said earlier today, talking to somebody else about this, is if you're somebody who reads technology things for pleasure, which believe it or not, some people do, where they're like, "Oh, I would love to read like like uh, let's say John Syracuse's uh, OS 10 reviews. I'd love to read 25,000 words about computers because it's fun and interesting and all that." I read John John's review every year, and I'm sad he's not doing one this year. But um, this is not that. This is not me expounding at length about photos and trying to paint you a word picture of uh, what it all means. This is very much like, how do I share photos? You know, how do I edit my photos? What are the options? Where are they? What do they look like? And just getting down to the detail of it. So I try to put my voice in there from time to time in terms of some jokes or some references. But the fact is, it is about getting getting down to the details of it. And it's very visual. And I like that about it. It was an interesting challenge to build it in that way where, you know, it, you know, in so many books, the author is completely removed from the production process. The author writes a manuscript in like Microsoft Word or something and then sends it in and sends in their screenshots and they walk away. And this was not like that. I, I you know, every page is me and my editor going back and forth and fitting everything in, you know, balanced like on the head of a pin in some cases like we can't let that line go over how could we reword it it is it is a very carefully constructed uh, book 
and, and I'm sorry because I did not mean to imply that it's not a thorough examination. It's just not. <laughs> I just had to clear that up. Well, I had to clear, had yeah, to clear no, that I'm, up. It, 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 I feel like I covered almost every every feature that's in there. What it doesn't cover is theoreticals. I've heard from a lot of people who are like, what if I did this? Or I have this very particular strange workflow that only I use. It's not covered in the book because that's not, I can't read your mind. And, you know, uh, but what, what does it do and how does it work? And what advice do I have for users about how to approach it? That's all in there. And I think it's very clear and visual, which is very helpful when you're learning about how to use a computer thing to actually see what you're talking about. Yeah, I, as a, as compared to some of the manuals that try to cover every workflow and every eventuality, and frankly, it, it, in today's world, I'm not saying we're beyond that because there's still plenty of people writing really great books. But I think there is more of an appetite to consume things in smaller chunks and in specific task-oriented fashion. Yeah, there are lots of ways to skin a cat too. I mean, if somebody wants to read a book, I'm sure somebody is writing a book. Um, uh, Jeff Carlson may actually be writing a book <laughs> uh, on this topic that that is going to take a much more expansive view. And then David Sparks has done a video that he's selling for $10, which is the same price as my book. That's a two hour video where he walks through photos. There are lots of different ways to approach this. It depends on what your, uh, how you learn. Um, I think this format is fun because it's good as, uh, not only for learning, but for reference that you can pull it out, um, and say, I mean, it's an ebook, you would have to print it out and then staple it and then keep it somewhere and then pull it out or you just open the pdf and say how do i do that and look and be like oh oh, that i didn't know i could do that it can be used as reference and it can be used as a learning tool but you know everybody learns differently but i do like that i think that's an advantage of this format is it's uh it's very visual and, and clear about what you're learning yeah, I, I very much like it for that very reason, that it is very visual. It's very specific, very targeted to the topic on that particular page or yeah, you screen. Could, you could argue that it is the culmination of whatever it is, 10 or 15 years of Adam and Tanya doing the Take Control book series, that they decided after all of the lessons they've learned about putting together books and how people use their books and what people want out of their books, that they built this and it really was Adam and Tanya and Joe Kissel, who's written, you know, 50 books for them, the, um, who came up with this and, and, and have worked on this format. And so I think that's kind of cool, too. That This is people who have done this enough now that they, they, they put all the lessons that they've learned into the format. And this is not the first one. Um, my friend Sholly McFarland did a book about uh, Yosemite, I believe, last fall. That was in the crash course format. So they've done a few of these now, and and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting idea. It makes a great PDF. The PDF, the the EPUB and the iBooks version are good. The PDF it looks great. It's it's a really nice piece of work. They did a good job with the design. Okay, so let's let's go back to photos. Having gone through this process to to build this book piece by piece, as you say, what is what is photos particularly good at? What's photos not particularly good at? Uh, photos is good at oh you know I think photos is good a lot at a lot of things. Photos is good at you know using iCloud Photo Library. It, it, it's a really nice feature. I, I like it a lot. Um, we talked about that at the at the beginning. Uh, it, it, I think its editing features are very nice. They are they are much more comprehensive than one might expect. They're much more comprehensive than what was in iPhoto. I think they're very I think they're beautiful and easy to use. I think the design of the of the editing interface is really good. I love that there are tiers of editing where, you know, if you want to just do an Instagram style filter that you can do that. Um, if you want to do a, um, uh, you know, a quick enhance with one button, you can do that. Uh, but if you want to break it down and add a whole bunch of different layers of different effects and adjust the levels and adjust the white balance and all of those sorts of things, you can do that. You can make some pretty impressive um, changes to the look of the photo uh, if you want to, but you don't have to dive that deep if you don't want to. And I think that's, I think it's a nice combination. Um, it's bad at going outside of what it expects you to do. Like, you know, plus the, I think it's bad at some features that just don't, that just, they didn't have time to build in. So if you want to self-organize an album, you can do it. You can drag things around. But if you want to like sort an album based on a sort criteria that isn't uh, time with the oldest at the top and the newest at the bottom, you can't. You just can't. It doesn't give you those options. You can manually sort or you can date sort in the one direction, and those are your choices. Uh, I imagine they'll figure that out eventually. 
I love how it, um, like I said, it indexes based on location. So it's really great at being able to say, show me pictures from Hawaii, but it won't let you add location to photos that don't have embedded location data, which is a feature that iPhoto had. They just blew it. I mean, I think they've just decided it was too much work and they, they put it off. I hope that's the number one feature on their list to add back in because it makes a whole lot of pictures that you take, you took maybe in the past completely useless in that regard because they don't have location data applied to them. So, you know, it's a mixture. I, I, I think generally it is, um, I think it's good. I think most of my complaints about it are about it being, um, yeah, not as flexible. And I understand why Apple would do that because they want to keep it simple. But there's some features that, you know, a little more flexibility would probably be uh, a benefit. And maybe those start to get added in as they move forward with updates. Updates. This is Photos 1.0. Do you think that there will be I mean, obviously, there will be a Photos 2.0 at some point. Do you think we'll see a Photos Pro? I don't. I don't. I think this is very much meant to be in sync with a, a Photos on iOS, that this is going to be your your editing and, um, and, uh, and cataloging app. And if you want something more than that, uh, that you should. I hope that there, there is a support for external photo editing at some point. Uh, either via extensions or via just a you know a command that that does it some more some more interfaces for that. Uh, I hope that happens because um, sometimes you do want to open something in an external editor uh, if you're a little more advanced user. But you know the fact is if you're somebody I would not I would not wait around if you're an Aperture user and you look at this and I'm like this is not for me it's it's too simple. Um, I wouldn't wait around for Apple. I would get 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 the immediately to like Lightroom. Uh, and just forget about it because I don't think Apple wants to be in the business of making uh, pro photographer tools anymore. And I don't, you know, I, I think if you look at the scale of what Apple is, uh, uh, what Apple's other businesses are, I think that that that's just a, a very small market for them. And quite honestly, Adobe does a pretty good job of serving that market already. And you can get you can get Lightroom and Photoshop for a hundred dollars a year. It's a pretty good deal, actually. Um, the creative cloud has a whole bunch of different bundles, but that bundle is super cheap in my opinion for what you get. And I, I spend a hundred dollars a year on that. And I think it's great to get access to the latest version of Photoshop and Lightroom on top of it. It's a pretty good deal. So I don't think there's going to be, I, I think there's a certain percentage of people who look at pro photography apps and it's aspirational. They are not really professional photographers. You know, they p people often use the word prosumer. It's like somebody who they have more as more aspiration than um, than being your generic iPhone iPhoto you know point and shoot snapshot user. But they're not necessarily um, gonna de gonna deliver on that. They don't actually need that. I think those people may be satisfied with photos, but and maybe not. But uh, actual like professional photographers, it just you know, Apple's not going to satisfy you. I think in I think ever personally. How about the speed, Jason? You're talking about a fifty-two thousand photo library, and I'm thinking, okay, that that's great. That's what you've got now. What are you going to have in two or three years? And how is iCloud library and how is Photos going to hold up to a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand photos? Well, I, I amassed these photos over. Over this is uh, 14 years of photos, so I don't think I'm going to go to 100,000 from 50,000 in a couple. I don't think it's ex increasing exponentially. In fact, as my kids get older, and I'm going to make a joke here and say older and less cute. Uh, that's yeah. not true. Totally not true. <laughs> uh, as my kids become teenagers and refuse to have their pictures taken, let's phrase it that way. Uh, I don't. I don't anticipate that it's going to be growing rapidly. I think it'll just keep on kind of going along. I would say that uh, a twenty thousand up to about twenty or thirty thousand, the the um, library speed is really um, super smooth. At fifty thousand, sometimes it, sometimes it's a little slow if you're scrolling all the way from the top to the bottom. You definitely recognize it on the iPhone and the iPad. Like I said, I think iOS uh, needs to fix some bugs that uh, make it really bogged down when it's got a large library. I think they just weren't paying attention to the speed of the photo picker when you've got 50,000 you know, photos in your library. I think that they're going to have to deal with that because it's certainly a problem. Um, but at 50,000 on the Mac, it's, it's a little slow, but it's fine. I would say that it's dramatically faster than it was at the same 
sort of moving around as uh, for the same library as iPhoto was. In fact, I had to split my iPhoto library in two because iPhoto just could not handle it. And now I put them all back together and it works pretty darn well. So it's always going to be an issue. Apple is always going to be fighting against the size of the library because every time they make it faster, people take more pictures. This was the story with I- iPhoto during its entire existence. I wish I could tell you that it's smooth as butter at 52,000 photos. It's not. It's smooth as butter at maybe 20,000, though. And at 52,000, it's fine. It's not perfect, but it's way better than what I had before. And unless I'm like scrolling around through 50,000 photos, I don't notice. Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Casper, a better mattress for a better night's sleep. To find out more, try one for 100 days and get a $50 discount. Visit casper.com slash macvoices and use the code macvoices when you place your order. When you order a Casper mattress, you get an obsessively engineered product at a shockingly good price. We're not talking 5 or 10 or even 20% savings over what you find in the mattress warehouses or department stores. We're talking a whole lot more than that, because when you're talking about Casper, you're talking about a premium mattress, not one of the cheap ones. You're talking about the perfect pairing of latex foam and memory foam to give you a better night's sleep for brighter days. You're talking about a mattress made in America that can be had for $500 for a twin size mattress, up to $950 for a king. Compare that to any mattress that you've been looking at, and you'll realize just what kind of percentage savings we're talking about. There are other advantages to a Casper mattress, too. First, you don't have to visit the mattress showroom, lay down for five minutes and try to figure out the difference between mattresses, or whether you like it or don't like it, and what fits you. Your Casper mattress comes with a 100-day free trial in your home. If you don't like it, and I can't imagine that, then you'll have a painless return process where they send someone for your mattress. You don't even have to repack it. And speaking of packing, your Casper arrives at your doorstep in a compact box just waiting to spring to life. Is your bedroom upstairs? I'm convinced that today's architects don't build houses to get mattresses upstairs easily. If you take your Casper upstairs before unpacking it, it's no more difficult than a big load of laundry. Then open your new mattress, watch it spring to life, and be ready to go in about five minutes from the start of unboxing to finish. So what you've got is a premium mattress that is the best you've ever had, a great price, convenient delivery, easy to maneuver to your bedroom, and even easier to set up, and a free 100-day trial period. What more could you want? Oh, a discount? I've got that covered too. If you go to casper.com slash macvoices right now, you can get $50 off your choice of any Casper mattress with the discount code MACVOICES. You need to go to that URL and use that code. So again, it's casper.com slash macvoices and the discount code MACVOICES to get $50 off the best mattress you've ever owned. When you've received your Casper, I'd love to hear from you and how you like it, because I don't know anyone who's tried a Casper and been unhappy. In fact, they're usually better people because they get a better night's sleep. That could be you. Casper.com for the best night's sleep you've ever had and the discount code MACVOICES to save $50. Do it today, sleep better by the end of the week. Thanks to Casper for their support of Mac Voices. And see, I'm catching myself doing it too. How many people are going to really have 20,000, 50,000 photos? Uh, there, there are some, and certainly parents. Yeah, well, parents and people that have scanned old photos, and you know, they're they're that. But there's also this thing that we're all carrying our iPhones with us more and taking more photos. Yeah, and you, and there's this terrible temptation just to not bother. I mean, sort of like Gmail. Just don't delete anything. Just yeah. just shove it all no, in I there. Think- I, I think that's where it. we're going is is all this stuff is just going to be in the library and then you will go back and dig through it later. And that essentially that's I mean, I am not a hobbyist photographer. I mean, we do have an SLR um, and I take pictures with it sometimes and we've got a couple lenses. But I would not say that I'm a, uh, you know, a hardcore photography person at all. And I uh, and and we bought a, a digital camera a month before my daughter was born 14 years ago. Um, coming up 14 years now. And uh, we have amassed with two kids and living for 14 years, we have amassed just from that 55,000 photos. So, you know, could we do 
I mean, Google has explored things like this. You know, they've got this auto awesome feature and some stuff like that. The idea that you could maybe apply even more levels of intelligence on top of a photo library and like hide photos that it, it can determine are out of focus or don't have anything interesting in them. Not delete them, but hide them or deprioritize them. Find you know fifteen photos taken in, in about a minute that are all that all look pretty much the same and group them together automatically and pick the one that looks like it's composed the best. I, I think Apple could probably do more on that front to make these um, libraries more manageable. And I know Google has invested a lot of effort, and Adobe has invested a lot of effort in that. So I think I think that's going to be the solution: is you just take all your photos, and uh, we'll figure it out. Like. Uh, the iPhone has in burst mode. The, the iPhone actually does this. If you hold down the the button, it'll take you know 15 shots and it picks one. It actually uses math to figure out what it thinks the best picture is, and you can go and change it. But it's pretty good at picking the best picture, and and so you know that that's going to be. I I really believe what what happens here uh, in the future is. Um, we're just going to keep taking pictures. They're going to be added to the database of our lives. And instead of going through and saying, well, I know you took 50 pictures, um, but let's cut that down to the best 10 and delete the others. Well, why delete them? I, I, I found a bunch of outtakes from pictures we took of my daughter as a baby for our first Christmas card with her that are amazing and that I haven't seen in 13 years. Um, I'm glad that those outtakes are still there. But do I need to see them all the time or can software do some prioritization for me and can automatically you know basically disappear the ones that are all blurry and and messed up that i, th I i'm encouraged by that i think that we're going to get uh we're going to get better but like you said it's going to be like gmail you keep everything and then let the computers figure it out <laughs> i was thinking about burst mode when you started to answer that and and i've been surprised at just how well that does work even if you whether you take a short burst or a long burst it gives if not the best one by your taste, and uh, certainly one of the top five or ten. It's amazing what math can do. I mean, I, I did a demo once, uh, meeting with a bunch of scientists from Adobe. Who, uh, you know, Adobe was basically just doing a tour with them to say, "Look, we have scientists." But it was pretty impressive. Like these are people; they know a lot of math. And 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 you know what? You it is amazing what kind of stuff advanced mathematics and. Uh, very clever algorithms can do in terms of images. And you see it, you know, with stuff like uh, the content aware fill that's in Photoshop, where you can say, you know, this part is missing, and you press the fill button, and it fills it with something that looks exactly like it should. That's ma that's really smart math. And uh, you've seen that with enhancing, um, they did this thing about enhancing photos to actually like increase their resolution. Um, which is kind of crazy, but it actually actually works. You 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 take the adjacency of the pixels and you can do some analysis and make some really smart guesses that it, that makes the, the the pictures much more sharp than they were before. Um, applying resolution where there you know where you would say there isn't any more signal in the noise here. It turns out there is signal there. It's just harder to pull out, but the, somebody clever can do it. I, I I love that kind of stuff, and and also um, not just in the image data, but in the metadata, being able to do some intelligent things. Somebody did, a, I think Microsoft did a paper about um, being able to extend uh, photos and adjust photos based on location data. Like it knows that you're taking a picture of yourself in front of a landmark, and it can actually like offer to put in the rest of the building that got cut off in your photo because it knows where you were and the angle you were, <laughs> and it can just seamlessly blend that in. I mean. This is all, I mean, it sounds like science fiction, but it's all actually really doable. So it would not surprise me if that's, you know, that's the future of all of this is just smart computers saying, you know, here are the photos. I ideally, you should be able to go away on, on a holiday with your family and all of you take pictures with your phone and you should be able to come home and there is a slideshow of the best things that happened that is that the computers have put together that is immaculate like better than what you would do if you spent 5 hours putting it together and i think there are attempts to do that now but if it can't do that now it will be able to do that in the next 5 or 10 years there's no doubt about it so this is this takes us way beyond the scope of your book, but yes, don't um, look for this in my book. <laughs> no, don't look. No, don't look for it in the book. But it, it, is this where it's headed? Where is that? And is that maybe why Apple theoretically, depending on your point of view, has taken a step back and maybe gone in another direction? I think. Um, 
I think the cloud stuff is important because a lot of this stuff needs to happen with really smart software running on servers and that maybe Apple's model of embedding all of the intelligence on your computer is not the way forward. And so the nice thing about having your iCloud photo library is that in theory, you know, iCloud could be doing intelligent things and talking to the app and having them work together. Um, but this is a disadvantage of Apple being a device focused company is that a lot of the interesting stuff that's happening here is happening in the cloud. Not all of it, but a lot of it is happening up there. Like Google stuff has been very impressive, um, in analyzing your photo library, but you can do that on the desktop too. Um, and we'll see how, we'll see how it has to go. But I, I definitely think iPhoto was conceived at a time when, um, you know, Steve Jobs had to use this labored kind of shoebox metaphor to explain how it worked and how di these newfangled digital cameras, ne you needed a place to store the stuff you took with them because you wouldn't want to throw them out, um, but you need a shoebox to put them in. And we've come a long way from the shoebox era. And so now, yeah, I mean, photos is part of Apple's strategy to um, – update what people do with their photos for the modern era. And, and it's true. One of the most powerful things about the whole thing is just syncing the pictures you took on your phone with your computer so that you can use your computer to edit the photos or, or build slideshows or, or print books or things like that. I mean, you can edit photos right on the device too, but to have them all just kind of sync together and be seamless, um, you know, that's the kind of stuff we want now and much less about fiddling around with little tiny organizational details, I think. Okay, to, to again get back to the book for a second, we keep we keep running off. How about the transition to photos from iPhoto or from Aperture? Painful, painless. Uh, any any tips, thoughts, recommendations for those who are contemplating this? Or maybe, uh, may, excuse me, but we also should mention maybe you don't have a, a choice because if you've installed the latest update. Well, you, you, you do have a choice. So okay. um, if you install the latest update, you'll find that Photos is in the dock. But that does not mean that iPhoto or Aperture is gone. They're both still there. And if you try to open them, they will give you a warning that says, you know, we migrated this to Photos. You can ignore that warning. All that warning is really saying is if you make changes now, they won't be also made in photos because these are now separate. You know, we imported them. Now they live over there. You know, if you had a photo here, it doesn't go over there. It's, it, that, that's what the warning is. So you can, you can not use photos and just keep using Aperture or iPhoto and it works fine. Um, you, the, the nice thing is because of the way that Apple set it up, it set it up with a minimum of hard drive space. It doesn't like duplicate your library. It's actually sharing the space between the two libraries uh, using a, this thing called hard links, which is a crazy thing that breaks the metaphor of files in the finder. So don't think about it too hard. But basically, those files are like uh, existing in a special kind of quantum state where they, they exist in both libraries. But if you edit one of the files or delete one of the libraries, all the files remain with the other one. They're not like aliases where they could break if something got deleted. It's sort of like the, the computer takes care of all of that. Um, and that means that you can throw away one library, uh, throw away your photos library and keep your iPhoto library or vice versa. You won't really save any space to speak of because they're sharing the space. Um, I think it's worth trying out photos and, 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 and you can always go back. If you don't do a lot of importing and organizing and stuff in fo photos and you just kind of leave it the way it is imported from photo, from Aperture or iPhoto, then you can make that judgment. You can say, oh, um, I don't like this or, and I'm just going to go back. And there's really no penalty at that point if you haven't done a lot of importing and stuff that you have to re-import in your old library. So it's worth trying out. It tries to do a very good job even when there are features that are not supported in the new app. Um, it tries to migrate them over. So like there are um, in, in photos, there's only the concept of favorites, but in, um, in aperture and iPhoto, there was the copy of star ratings. And I think this is one of those examples where Apple is saying people, most people are not that fiddly. They're just not that fiddly with, I, I give this a two, I give this a three. Um, but if you have those ratings, they come over as keywords. So if you've got a four star photo, it, one of its keywords in photos is four star. So your metadata is saved. Um, if you apply a color label in Aperture, it comes over as a keyword of the color. <laughs> so they, they've tried very hard not to lose any data. Um, all of your um, albums come across, at, or all of your events come across as albums. 
So if you really did organize and rely on iPhoto events, they're still there, but they're not, um, they're not in what Photos does, which is entirely automatic and is called Moments. Um, it, it saves all of your manually generated uh, events as, as uh, iPhoto albums in a subfolder. So you can get to everything. It's all there. Um, your originals and your edited versions both come across. So if you need to revert to the original later, the original's still there. Um, so it, I, I feel like there's no penalty in trying it. And if you don't like it, yeah, you can just delete the photos library or even just leave it there and not worry about it and keep using iPhoto or Aperture for as long as you want um, until, you know, presumably some future operating system update kills it. But I would imagine that wouldn't happen for a while. You've made me enthusiastic about about doing this, about taking my library and and putting it into photos and moving it to iCloud library um, so that First of all, you've got you've you've got all of that accessible. More importantly, though, you've got it off of your machine, and th it's, it may be a poor example, but it starts to feel like my contacts and my calendar. They're all living in the cloud. The, the truth is in the cloud, no longer on any of my Macs necessarily. Yeah, um, I would not recommend that people view iCloud Photo Library as a backup. I think some people will, but if you're you know, the cloud is not a backup. Something bad could happen in the cloud. If you delete something or edit something in one device, it automatically propagates to all the other devices. Fortunately, Apple has done a good thing, and there's a deleted items hidden folder in iCloud. So if you delete an item one, one place, it doesn't actually vanish from the cloud. It just goes to the deleted items folder, and it lives there for 30 days before it dies. So you've got time. But still, Photos are precious. I would recommend that anybody who is using iCloud Photo Library have a Mac somewhere that has the settings set to download everything. And it's one of the settings in Photos is you can say download everything or dynamically use space, which is basically how you can look at a you know 1.5 terabyte photo library on a uh, computer with a 750 gigabyte SSD. Uh, you know it doesn't fit, but yet it's there which is great. Um, but I would recommend if you have a Mac somewhere with a big hard drive that you set it to download everything, keep everything, and then back that thing up so that you've got it in the cloud, you've got it on that Mac, and you've got that Mac backing up somewhere else. And yeah, I know that seems like a lot of layers of protection, but you know what? You know, your photos are memories of your life and they're too precious to risk um, to, you know, to just trust Apple servers. I'm sure... Apple's got backups and all sorts of things in place, but boy, imagine uh, an Apple server hiccup that causes your photos to die or some of your photos to disappear without your knowledge and then you discover much later that they're gone. That's not, not good. So I would, take, I would use an online backup solution or Time Machine or both plus have it on that Mac plus iCloud. That's what I'm doing. Some, uh, somehow the topic of backups applies all every show all the time to everything. It does. Well, with the cloud, you know, I, I think what most of us would say is you just can't trust the cloud on its own for the backup. It's like, you know, this is not a backup service, right? There's no version control in iCloud Photo Library. There's just this sort of holding bin. It's not, it's not even at the point of like Dropbox or, or, uh, or Backblaze or Crash Plan. It's, um, it's not. So, you know, don't use it as that. Sort of just like saying RAID is not a backup. iCloud is not a backup. It's, it's, uh, it's great that it's there. And you might need it as a backup sometime, but th you shouldn't have that be your only source of data because it's new and what if something happens and would, wouldn't you be better off with a more diversified portfolio for your precious family photos? So take uh, photos, a take control crash course is available. You say 60 pages. Um, it's at takecontrolbooks.com. How much does this go for, Jason? So it's it's uh, ten dollars. Uh, okay. The P the PDF is around sixty pages. There's also an iBooks version that should be arriving in the iBook store uh, in a matter of days if it's not already there, and on Kindle I think as well. So there's a there's a you know less less gorgeously laid out version as well as the PDF, which looks really nice. And, uh, and they do a good job converting all of that stuff with Adam and Tanya. So ten ten bucks. Um, you know, basically all you need to know about all the features in Photos for Mac. Uh, and there's some a bunch of samples on uh, TakeControlBooks.com if uh, you want to see samples of that book and others. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how does it feel to write your first book in uh, a while? 
first book since the 90s. Uh, wow. Like I said, it, it, it I think Tanya is right. It was more like writing a series of magazine articles than writing a book. First off, there's not a narrative, you know, to speak of. It, it is these chapters that are by feature. And then it's not like I'm sitting down in front of a blinking cursor and writing, uh, you know, 2000 words and, and seeing what happens to it later. I'm literally writing paragraphs and dropping in screenshots and crafting captions to reference what's in the paragraphs. And it's all very carefully done. So it's a very different kind of feel from like, I mean, I've written... I've written some novels in in the last ten years, um, none published. Although some of them I am rewriting, so hopefully one day. Um, but the uh, the, uh, the the computer book thing, yeah, it's different. This is not my old book in the '90s was like that. It was very much like just Microsoft Word, and you write and write and write and write. And uh, this is not. This is a different kind of thing. Um, but that's the beauty of uh, where we are in this media landscape is that, you know, content used to be very specific about like, you know, black and white pages in a book that had to be a certain number of pages and then we would ship it all out. And and it's not like that. I mean, this is uh, ebook only. Can't get it in paper unless you print it out yourself. Um, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of fun. I'm glad I know a lot about um, photos. And since I left Macworld, I've been trying to explore other things um, and then and learn from that, like sort of like what are the best uses of my time. And so I wanted to try the book stuff and see how much time does it take? You know, how many copies can we sell? Sort of like do the math. Is this a, a thing for me to do more of or is this a thing that I should not do? And uh, we'll see how it goes. You know, I, I, I know how much time it took. We'll see how well it sells. And we'll see what my other options are. And, and uh, you know, I'm not opposed to doing another, whether uh, from tidbits or on my own. And uh, if the right topic comes out. So we'll have to see. But this was, it was nice. This is a brand new app from Apple. It was um, good to be able to put in the time and have a reason to do it. So, folks, go out there and encourage Jason to do more uh, one <laughs> way or another by buying the book. And you'll get a great book on top of it and a great book in a great format. So that's great. Um, Jason, where I, I, I've lost track. You know, since you left Macworld, yep. when you were at Macworld, I kind of had I, I, kept, I kept a bead on you, but then you started with the incomparable, then Clockwise, the Clockwise podcast, and now I've just completely lost track. Would, so, would you like me to explain how people can find me? I would love for you to explain because right. I don't, I can't tell everywhere that they can find you. Okay, uh, so I write regularly about Apple and other related technology stuff at sixcolors.com, s i x colors.com. And uh, you can find my pop culture podcasting at theincomparable.com. And then I host two shows on Relay. That's Relay.fm. And those shows are Clockwise and Upgrade. So I am doing lots of podcasts and writing at Six Colors. And then you can also find my work in addition to this book, I Take Control. I'm writing a column weekly right now for Macworld, my old stomping grounds. And um, monthly-ish at iMore. Uh, and a bunch of other places on the internet. So um, I get around, and that's part of me figuring out what I what I want to keep and what I want to um, not keep because it's been kind of a crazy few months where I've been doing too much, but kind of knowingly doing too much, and now I have to figure out sort of what I do, how I focus. But, you know, Six Colors and the podcast of The Incomparable at Re and Relay are the ones that are the, the – the, those, those are my home bases. Are you having fun? I am having fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. That's, that answers it right there. Just keep whatever, wherever yep. you're having the fun, keep doing it. I think I think that's right. I I, uh, I seem to have gone from I'm having fun, but I have no idea if this is going to be able to uh, support my family or I'll ha if I'll have to get a real job. To I'm having fun, and I think it is going to be able to support my family. That's a good next step. So I'm on step two. I've only been out of uh, the corporate life for about eight months, so uh, there's time yet for me to learn a lot more about where exactly I'm going. But having a good time. Good. Well, I hope you'll come back and, and see us under whatever banner you want to come under. Uh, we of course. Always, we always love having you. I'll bring my own banner. That's great. That's great. Good to see you, Jason. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Chuck. Folks, again, photos, a take control crash course at takecontrolbooks.com. That's Jason Snell at Six Colors, and I'm sure he can, you can link to everything off of there. Until the next time, this is Mac Voices. I'm Chuck Joyner. We'll be back. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Mac Voices blog. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news, 
from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.